If the discovery by Judy and her colleagues are established, it would mean the infectious part of the Wuhan virus, the S protein, incorporated the sequence of the HIV key protein. This made me think of the immunodeficiency symptoms in people infected. They were doing research on a human transmittable coronavirus that was actually published in a paper. So this is research that they actually published. They were working on developing a coronavirus for the human host, which you know leads you to question, why would you be creating a coronavirus that can infect humans? What would be the purpose of that research? Is it, is it for a weapon? Is it so that you can then create a vaccine that you are the sole recipient of the profits from? The Chinese have full access to our databases. They have full access to all that research that comes out. They have full access to all our universities to train their scientists. And they have full access to our scientists, like was, you know, with the recent indictment of the uh, head of the chemistry department at Harvard. I mean, this is the Thousand Talents program. Tens of thousands of, of, the, most, uh, of the world's most brightest people in all of these different um, areas that are going to China to help them with their programs. And all of these programs, as you know, have a dual use capability. Beijing's attacks on the United States, which have occurred for weeks and weeks, are really worrying. What it shows is that China is desperate and the United States needs to defend itself because China is propagating this narrative that we spread the coronavirus to China. So the United States needs to just come out with the facts about how China took coronavirus samples from Canada and the United States. They sent them to Wuhan. We don't know exactly what went on in that lab there at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but it's time for the United States to defend itself. January 23rd, 2020, the Wuhan virus exploded. While Wuhan announced the lockdown of the city, Xi Jiangli and her team released a paper stating that the Wuhan coronavirus was of probable bat origin. This was published in Nature on February 3rd. The paper indicated that the Wuhan virus utilized the same key as SARS to gain entry into the human body. She also announced the 2019 NCOV genome sequence was 96.2% consistent with a bat coronavirus originating in Yunnan, China, called RATG13, signaling a natural source of the Wuhan virus. However, Xi Jiangli's natural origin assertion was doubtful. The outbreak occurred in Wuhan, the same location as the P4 laboratory where she was based and which housed highly similar viruses. Common sense would lead the government to first inspect the P4 laboratory for any leakage incident and potential safety concerns. Instead, they shifted public attention from the P4 laboratory to the South China Seafood Wholesale Market that sold no bats and designated it as the origin of the disease. At the same time, authorities sealed off all virus samples prevented international experts from joining the investigation, and used national television to slander doctors such as Li Wenliang, who disclosed the outbreak for spreading rumors. If the Wuhan virus indeed emerged naturally, why would the CCP need to censor relevant news or block investigations? Could the Wuhan P4 laboratory have its secrets? Virus samples and genome sequences maybe the exact ingredients we need to find our answers. When but I first the fact that uh, the Communist Party is covering this up, it should trouble us deeply. Then you see the World Health Organization take over YouTube. And what's amazing is now at the bottom of every YouTube video, even from Chris Martinson with his, uh, with his daily updates, and he's just reading facts. Now it's the World Health Organization is a forced link to go to the site, so for any person who doesn't know what, who the World Health Organization is, they go there to get the propaganda. Not the facts, not the truth, they get the propaganda, they get the talking points from the World Health Organization. And that is also very, it's a shame that American corporations, especially social media, like Google, like Facebook and Twitter, they're trying to censor or, or ban or shadow ban or manipulate algorithms, so on and so forth, to prevent an actual honest conversation. The best way this is going to be answered, all this, because we want the truth. 
The biggest issue I've learned over my 40-year career, it's not really fighting the viruses and learning how to treat the viruses. It's fighting a system that is determined to cover up and persecute anyone who reveals the truth behind. There's a lot of, right now there's a lot of things happening. China. Why are there no consequences for China for the misinformation that they no shared? Consequences? We have been asked How do you know there, there are no of, consequences? What are the consequences, Mr. President? I wouldn't tell you. China will find out. Well, why would I tell you? People are concerned that they stole. No, you started off by saying, "Why are there no consequences?" Why are there no consequences? How do you know there are no consequences? Are no consequences? You You're going to find say, out. I wouldn't tell you. You'd probably be the last person on earth I'd tell. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, All right. Well, welcome everybody to this live stream. I hope we are still live and on the air. We're going to stay on live as long as possible. Um, I have posted a backup stream in the chat. You can just go follow me on Twitter at DW Truth Warrior. So far, Twitter has not shut down any of my streams. So um, if somehow we get cut off during this broadcast, go check that out. And worst case, I'm recording and we'll figure that out later. But welcome. I uh, wanted to introduce um, that little clip, Michael. Uh, that's a new documentary that you can get from the Epoch Times. It's just over, I think it's about over an hour. Um, and it's an investigative piece that is really getting into the deep aspects about the the odd nature of this actual virus, the genetic sequencing, the history of China as a, as a government, the CCP, the fact that they've been silencing whistleblowers, doctors, nurses, lab technicians, um, they've been rounding up people that want to talk in China about any kind of other narrative, especially people that are behind the scenes that know that there's something really suspicious going on with this. And then, of course, we have um, some very interesting comments from the president. And so, um, Michael, you know, you reached out to me again to give some updates and bring in some psychology into the mix. And we titled this China, Can Nations Be Insane? So, Michael, welcome and take it away, my friend. Great, great. Thanks. Yeah, and great clip. Great clip. A lot, lot packed in there. You know, his responses to this pond slime, so disrespectful to, towards him and stuff like that. And he, he's right to just talk talk right over their heads. But no, I mean, uh, the title is rhetorical. Of course, of course, right? Nations and governments are insane. You know, I use the term sometimes unsane because insane is a classic medical condition in which, you know, Everybody knows it. Unsane is where you can walk around functionally insane and nobody knows it, right? So when you see China doing all of these things, as most nations are pretty much, they're good at doing, right? The politician, the structure, the hierarchy, the inability to allow criticism within their culture, things like that in China, you know, and, and countries like that, where it is, you know, it, it's getting bad like that. You know, it's getting bad here. With all of this shadow banning but regardless of what the stupid google and youtube do people are still speaking their minds they can still think their own thoughts you know despite all of that nonsense right so this is the element of freedom that yeah it's been chipped away at it's being gnawed at but it's being gnawed at then by by the force that we're talking about world communism the real enemy not the global elite you know or, or any of that or white rich men male and pale and all of the things that the socialists attempt to implicate no it's just called world communism it's really easy to get the mind around that you know they're you know we they have addresses we know their footprint we know the evil that they've done and if somebody cannot see the evil that it is, has been doing in the last lot of years well then there's no talking to people like that but see we why why i wanted to do this thing is just to remind people that don't fall for the idea you know that the commoner garden idea that insanity is only something that's found in individuals. You know, that's not going to help us. You see, you've, we've got to remember the pathology of uh, not only certain hierarchies, uh, but, but even on the biggest level, right? What is the biggest level? It's government, it's state. So that's, that's basically what it's all about that, Try to remember that psychological component. You know, it, it sort of frames things. It holds things together. It just makes it uh, makes a person understand that they should read all of life, you know, with psychological insight. And the pathology 
of which is normally associated, say, with a, a sick individual, must be, I think, uh, you know, magnified to a larger level. And if you run with that, then you see that maybe some, I've said it before, some boogaloo people in that country, practically senile or practically psychotic, have, you know, pushed the lever and set this in motion. And uh, if we if we look at that, then you say, hey, maybe there's no grand conspiracy, right? Uh, it's not that I'm negating. I'm, again, my work is always, you know, move around the thing and look at it from different perspectives, right? And there is one valid perspective that says this was pretty much accident, right? Uh, there's also astrological indications that there'll be, at the end of the year, Fiona Edgar, for instance, thinks that, uh, you know, there'll be another hoopla. This one will sort of fade as people get on top of it. And then there'll be some other sort of uh, fiasco towards December and January, right? Okay, what, what does that mean? If, if China is insane, right? Literally diagnosably insane the people have lost their minds because of this the decades and decades and decades of living under that type of oppression that was described in that video and the people should know about how could you possibly have so much straight jacketing right so much draconian control on a consciousness so to speak and then you know come out come out sane uh how could you have a culture that has never bothered to overthrow from within a pestilence that is so obvious, like I've said on one of the previous podcasts, what, the image of the West is not enough. The image of, of the success of Japan and the other capitalist countries, right, is not enough to make some of these, you know, utterly uh, backward lands and nations change. No, obviously in China's case, no, 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 it hasn't. It's still waving the flag. That doesn't look very s sane to me, right? And right now, Here's a perfect opportunity for China to do the right thing, overthrow these idiots at the top. But coming back to the point, what happens if these idiots at the top are so literally pathologically insane, so far from any grasping of sanity, right, that a small group of them or a larger group, whatever it may be, set this thing in motion. This would then indicate that, the, you know, that all these other ruminations that we've been watching and everybody's theories, you know, um, by and large, uh, apply, but apply less. Some are very, very applicable, but others maybe not, because the ones that speak of a much bigger, right, sort of conspiracy that, you know, set this off or whatever, let's just for a minute bracket that. It could be just the case of a country that's an actual historical meltdown, right? Just like Rome. You see, there's other precedents for this, just like Greece, just like Carthage, right, the Phoenicians, and just like Soviet Russia. Right? And if you're looking closely enough, the West is not in any way you know, exempt from meltdown. We're not in a first world status like a lot of people think. So, but we're not fully, we're not insane yet. Right? So it's just important to make sure that there's another reading to be taken. One of the most important, because of all the other readings that are showing, hey, it's okay, it's okay, we're getting it, it's going back into the green or whatever. A pathological society is not going back into the green. When the yeast is poured on top of the mixture, it's going to boil over and run all over the place. You know. And so we're not going to get into all the highways and byways of that discussion about, you know, how does a, how does a nation become, you know, insane, pathological, uh, disreality, uh, social contagion, that, that's a that's a long subject, right? But what we can do is take a few, you know, sort of uh, pathological states of an individual, right? Like schizophrenia, psychosis, neurosis, right? Obsessive compulsive, um, uh, defiance, right? The idea that you cannot criticize a person who is pathological, you know, and that certain pathological types, particularly the psychotic, but also the narcissist, are never wrong, even when they're wrong. Right? 12 jurors, you know, 150 witnesses in court, video footage. Oh, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Right? What do you, it was, it was somebody else. You've got it all wrong. Right? They're never guilty. Well, isn't communism all about that? 
you know, uh, the inability to sit at the table and criticize it. China's particularly like that. Korea, the same. You know, we're never wrong. We're, we've got the perfect system. We've got the perfect governmental system. Everybody's in, you know, signs on for it. Yeah, with a gun to their head. Uh, uh, you don't see that your communism is a religion? I thought you guys were all meant to be materialist atheists. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. On That's all on paper, for goodness sake. You know, uh, so, oh yeah, and in an individual, at the root of pathology, right, before pathology really starts, there's a thing that Wilhelm Reich, Reich talked about, which is called emotional plague. He also talked about armoring. Well, can't a culture be armored? Right? If you have media drip feeding you pathology from morning to night, can't a culture be infected with emotional plague? Most people don't even know what that is. And as I say, it would take too long to get into. But the idea is that a kind of thinking, a kind of view of reality, a kind of way of life that is not a way of life, that's sheltered, that's insular, that's totally draconian. And all Western cultures have, you know, bits of that. We still have dogmatic religion. We still have neuromythology. Uh, excuse me, I meant neuroscience, the wonderful glowing behaviorism. We have materialist atheism, right? We have all sorts of dogmas here. Just, a, the, you know, one hasn't arisen to such pathology, pathological levels that you can't have, you know, an alternative. Like 30, you know, what is it? 34, 38% of all uh, scientists are actually not atheists, right? And have some sort of uh, belief in a higher power, things like that. So again, you know, it's not all locked on in one sense, like it would be in a place like China that doesn't like grades or hues of color in any sense of the word. But the emotional plague, the armoring, can we have to ask that question if we can. What about schizophrenia? Total withdrawal, or in some cases, if it's not total withdrawal, it's a partial withdrawal, right, from reality. Because reality hurts. Is that what communism is? It's certainly collectivistic, right? It, it, which means that don't stand out. Sweden's been infected with that for years. Don't stand out. Don't make a, you know, a big noise. Don't try to show off. Well then, okay, but what do I do then? If I don't do all of those things and I don't believe in independence and individuality and self-expression, my God, is that not pathological? Doesn't that quell genius? Doesn't that uh, quell self-expression? But I thought we were on this planet to self-express. And anyway, who's telling me from on high, right, to, to not self-express? Or maybe it's not on high, it's the, it's the will of the many. Well, then the will of the many may be the toxic thing. You see, so we, we work it out. When you use the uh, acid test of psychology, you're able to work things out. You find out what the enemy really is, right? What's the real enemy? And then the people who enforce that that um, must be enemies of, you know, the self. And if you're an enemy of the self, then, you know, you set up a situation where there's a persona, where there's a, a false self, right? And a total avoidance of individualism. And the West is, if the West is anything, it's because in its best moments, it supported individualism. Doesn't mean that all the individuals were themselves sane, but in principle, individualism, right, was um, was foremost. And pretty much any of the pestilences that we've had, even in the West, were really kind of anti-individualistic, like the Puritans and, and so many other groups, right? Like socialism, the kind of socialism we have in the West is really a kind of a collectivism, and that and that hasn't it's not been very good. But uh, in a culture, right, that has been forced to wear a mask, say a culture that originally was very rich in one sense, let's say like China, right, hundreds of years ago or whatever, right, a great civilization, but with endless invasions and endless uh, colonizations and then finally the coming of communism, sucking the lifeblood out of that nation and for some reason making it also docile so that it doesn't, he, it doesn't call in the West. It doesn't say help us, right? I mean, Japan's right there. So it doesn't do all of this stuff. So that's where I'm talking pathology then, because something in the psyche of the of all China people, not Chinese people, not not just the elite that's ruling them, but something inside the average person wants it, wants this level of control, and that is a terrible, 
you know, infection and an affliction, really. Um, and one other thing to go into is um, we did it already in great depth in one of the shows on psychology where we went into Herbert Marcuse's ideas, right? He was a leading socialist Frankfurt School person who designed many uh, manuals for the colonization, especially of the young, but of the mind in, in a Western context, right? And one of the things was that he had just taken Freud's work and shrunk it down to the most simplest sort of uh, building blocks, right? Which is pleasure and pain. Man, Man's existence is just simply trying to avoid pain and have pleasure. Now, this actually is not true and has been shot down. But, um, you know, but just let's take it step by step here. And when man does experience pain, they note, uh, it will be because it, it serves a greater end, right? So, so like delayed gratification would be the middle ground there, right? You have to delay gratification, and some nations are really good at that and others are not, uh, certain races, right? So you delay gratification because you know that it actually will facilitate you getting something that's even greater, so a need that's even greater, right? And the more and more and more that cultures and races be, you know, lose this sense of delayed gratification, and you just have to look at the editing in media, the, the constant flashing, the constant cuts, the constant hyper uh, editing, you know, and all of this, and people's attention spans, which have been eroded over the years. This is kind of what I'm talking about. It, it, it's a, it's a, an epiphenomenon of, of this decline in delayed gratification. But even deeper than that, it means that you're, you're moving backwards toward the pleasure principle. The pleasure principle is perfectly okay in, you know, infants and pre-eatable uh, children or even up to seven years of old before that that that's the ruling principle so it's, it's sort of okay but as we move you know past six and seven years old we're meant to get the reality principle so marcuse's form of communism which is by the way is the kind that is installed we're talking about china but never forget the kind of communism socialism that we're actually familiar with so a little sketch of that is important here and that is that uh, we'll take people back to this you know dyad between needing pleasure and avoiding pain which is meant to be materialist atheists think this is the absolute root of all consciousness but as i said that 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 theory isn't you know sus sustainable but taking it as it is we see that delayed gratification then is this in between place where we will willingly experience a certain discomfort and pain as long as right we get the payoff at the end but marcuse was trying to instantiate a kind of feministic society, a feminism in the true philosophical sense of anti-masculine society. And that takes that's a hybrid thing that takes a lot of different forms, right? It's pernicious for women and it's pernicious for males, right? It hurts both sexes very badly. But the thing is that um, the thing is that if we move back into the pleasure principle, and then delayed gratification is destroyed, then the Western civilization comes to an end. So this has been sort of, again, when I keep on talking about socialism, chipping away, chipping away, this is what I mean, right? This kind of thing has been going on for decades, right? So we have this slow erosion of individualism, right? And it's weakened us so that we don't even know who the enemy is, right? So that would be, Tantamount, as I said, if you if it doesn't get stopped, right? If people don't get the psychology, then civilization there's nothing to stop the downhill descent, right? It's just like an avalanche, which in the end will destroy everything coming at us, right? But China obviously has been put on delayed gratification. You know, any kind of draconian control is denying you gratification, so they're not sinking back into the pleasure principle. But doesn't mean then that they are aware that they're cognizant of the reality principle? You know, this this equation. You see, so th there's that to bear in mind as well, because when you're under that kind of control, as I said, delayed gratification is meant to be your way up into the reality principle. And normally, normally it would be. But if other forces are working, right, to make sure that you never get to the reality principle, then what has happened? There's been some sort of suspension, you know, and it leads you then to look at maybe some other facts 
And then that leads you, what would be holding them back? Because if you're with the reality principle, then, you know, you're fully lucid and you would never sign on for something as ludicrous as communism. So then this brings us to the key thing I really wanted to get to talk about. We won't belabor the point because I know people absolutely hate this kind of discussion with a passion. So we'll keep it short. But the point is that there's the other feature that comes in is the superego, which is usually the seat of morality as society, you know, dictates it, but also the ego ideal, right? And the ego ideal, we've talked about it extensively on Unslaved, is the part of us that is uh, oriented towards heroic, right, models or imagos as they're called in psychology. Well, look at the iconic, look at the iconic uh, proportions of the communist leaders. Look at the iconic artwork, very similar to Nazi Germany, no doubt, but even more iconic in the sense of large, right? Mao Zedong, right? Lenin, Trotsky, the the uh, inflation of wormish, you know, worms, cockroaches, right? But through art, through media, and through decades and decades of uh, the uh, lionization, right? The Chinese mind must be, like a lot of the other communistic minds, possessed by the leader, the totemic father. It would lead us into a lot more discussion we're not going to bother with, right? But what I want to say is that, yes, but in, as soon as you have a totemic father bigger than you, higher up, it can't. the whole dynamic doesn't work unless you are very, very little, right? Big daddy, small you small child right so there's your infantilism so on one level yeah there's delayed gratification which you would think would bring people up to the reality principle and hey we'd have a, a, a thriving civilization we said there must be some uh, anvil he heavy block on that well now we find what it is All right so so super ego and an ego ideal are, are running at loggerheads here because the ego ideal has fixated right on something so immense that in order to maintain that there has to be a littleness within the little man that Wilhelm Reich so articulated. And there's where your emotional plague comes in. You, you've built these iconic figures, you know, the size of which is just gargantuan. You live under their shadow. And so your whole ego ideal, uh, also known as the idealized image, is colonized. And you cannot but be under its shadow. If you, if you step out of its shadow, you fall to pieces because that's been your reality. That's been your North Star. That's been your mooring post. So what happens on the individual level, and this does, and we have in the West many people who are, you know, victims of what I'm talking about. But as I said, we're not worrying about that. We're saying, can this be on the national level? And that little person, right, is going to hang on and hang on and hang on. But finally, if the leaders themselves, if something cracks, Right? And this is what we may be seeing right now. There's, we're not going to get into all the astrology of it. There's no need. It's just to orient people that if there's a crack right, and the big phallic father falls, it is, a, after all, a big balloon, right? Anyhow, and if the winds of fate, if something decides it's coming down, it's going to get popped, what will happen to these little people? Right, and the answer is we don't know. They could either set up a totally uh, a new set of draconian leaders, a new set. Uh, you know, that's why uh, there's a ambivalence in in China, or they allow themselves to go through this catharsis. They accept their littleness. They expect they accept that the experiment has failed, right, and they start slowly and gradually to help the Eastern Bloc, you know, build again on capitalistic lines, and maybe even do it better, right, better then we have done it because we, we're, we've not done a good job. Right? The, the capitalism, as Ayn Rand and uh, Mises and other people have uh, you know, uh, envisioned it, is far from what we call corporate socialism today. Right? Highly collectivized. You can't join Whole Foods or any place without you know, this entire, its entire corporate structure waving a red flag in your face. You know, again, don't stand out. Uh, or if you, they delude you. You know, there's certain delusion that you're standing out, but you're you'll soon find out how deluded that is. You're not meant to stand out at all. It's entirely manufactured. So again, you know, that's we should leave it there. But the idea is that there is 
emotional plague at the root right of certain cultures and nations and has been done through time take rome take you know greece like we said take the soviet union's fall uh, and it will happen even with other structures you know like in the middle east for instance ismal right there can be a the fractures there because it's all based in this inflation of the totemic father and now we'd have to spend hours getting into that we're not going to do that but safe to say that you live under its shadow right but if it should crack if it should turn away if it should fall obviously the ego structures crash as well leaving somebody in a docile completely psych psychotic state uh, schizoid state because you know how are you going to build again so it's just a factor of that in that there's always psychology behind the structures of government government is nothing that's very sane they, you know we've had we've been able to choose healthy capitalism and most people have not wanted it really you see but the, the, the thing that distinguishes these communistic countries is this extraordinary reliance, right, and adulation of the totemic image until the point of emotional plague, to the point of an armor, armored society. And I think that at some point, you know, it doesn't mean to dismiss all these other conspiracy theories or whatever, but it's, it means to really, in some way, at least allow psychology back to the table to factor it in, because whatever happens to China, you know, at the because if this is a domino effect, if this was just a, you know, unplanned unleashing of chaos but it's because the country itself internally is ready to fall actually as a civilization completely fall and then you know it's like a domino effect that will there'll be a couple of other hot points probably not affecting the west this one actually bled over and affected us severely and we're handling it but but the ones that happen sort of down the line six months from now right or whatever it's more internal we're all going to be sitting there wondering what to do so i'm looking ahead speculation obviously but uh, yeah, just to, just to, again, my job is just to plug in some of the basic, you know, psychology, Jungian, Freudian, you know, whatever, right? And and uh, hopefully that uh, you know gives gives people a little bit of insight. But it's also pertinent to our own religions. It's pertinent to our own leaders. It's pertinent to our own psychology. Oh, for sure. And I'm glad you brought that into it. And you know, the way I look at it is that by discussing what you've just brought up in terms of psychology in individual nations and then bringing in the idea of communism as an ideology, it, it, that's itself a religion of sorts, right? And we've, I've tried, I've on shows I've done on shows we've done together, Michael, we've shown even the lineage of those ideas and where they come from. They, China didn't invent it. They just perfected it in their own brand. Russia did their own brand. It was all just different experiments of these ideas that I think came from some of these lodges and things like that. Um, and, and even these other bigger cults behind the scenes, right? So it do, nothing of what you're saying to me contradicts any kind of bigger global network going on here. Uh, it, it, in fact, it just enforces it because if you look at what's happening, what we're doing in the West right now with the draconian measures, the lockdowns, the drones flying around telling people not to look at each other, the fines being handed out to people for taking their kids rollerblading, uh, for going to the beach, you know, these kinds of things. This smells like china and not just china but again communism and this whole thing that has been coming in through the west for decades and decades and decades that gia griffin was warning about that so many people that we've talked about have warned about right from military intelligence to the highest you know saying this is infecting the west and it is being done by agents from within who are colluding with foreign enemies and so the what I'm saying is that this is the virus, ultimately, and it's spreading. And the reactions that Western governments are happening, most of them anyways, I mean, we, we do have some exceptions here and there, but for by and large, the reactions are, it's, it's interesting how the, the virus originated in China, allegedly, right? And then the reaction worldwide is based off of the reaction that China had when the virus happened. So when, when the virus happened in China, China did what China does, which is lock down everything, Draconian measures, welding people into their homes. Who knows what you know? What else happened? Right, arresting anybody that was going to talk about it. And then when the World Health Organization, who's in league with China, and I'm actually going to do a live stream after this to go through some of those that information. Um, the the world the guy that it's the, one of the head of the World Health Organization. He's he's literally hugging and handshaking and laughing with President Xi and some of these Chinese ambassadors, and they're recommendations to the western governments 
are the recommendations that come from the same modus operandi that China used on their own people. So the virus isn't just the virus. The virus was the reaction and the installation of communistic and socialistic and globalism type ideas into the West, which they've been trying to do forever. We've been covering this forever. They've been trying to do this forever. They were already doing this anyways. On my part, I don't think this is an accident. I don't think it, you'd have to really pull me by the nose to think that it's an accident. I, I think it's important to they speculate, of course, but and maybe there's accidental agents that didn't know what they were doing, but um, there's just too much. Like for me, seeing the plan to uh, take over the education system in the West, to topple the economy and turn it away from true capitalism, as you were talking about, which most people don't even understand that word. So we'll do a show on that someday. Um, and, and to do all these things, to undercut Western peoples and just the basic idea of freedom and liberty. This is what we're talking about, right? Um, that was an eight, that's been a decades, decades agenda. And then when you look at the documents and the manuscripts coming out of these big organizations like the World Health Organization, and these other agents who are in league with organizations like China and others, they are looking for China as the model for the global super state. That is their words. That is in their documents. That is now publicly admitted. There's no behind the doors conspiracy to it. So then comes along this virus as if on a silver platter in a way. You know, and that's why I say maybe there were forces that it, maybe it started accidentally and then it was co-opted and used to push the gas pedal on what they already wanted to do. Or maybe there was something that was actually released by the Chinese government on their own people to dispel all the protests that were going on, the resistance to the to, there's all these different ideas. Right. But either way, for you to say, hey, let's look at the psychology of it is to me, it's brilliant and it's important because it's what people are forgetting that. This is the virus, the psychological virus that is being spread, which is it's done through fear. That's how you get people on the leash. Then it's installed through, you know, it's the trauma, right? But then it's installed through, well, you need to be saved. Here's the big brother, totemic father character that we're going to install here. Um, and then at that point, you've just given up all of your sovereignty because it all started up here, right? And so I right. just see that as honestly the, the real virus, whether it's individually done by China, whether it's they're used as a glove puppet for bigger forces that have a bigger agenda to keep their power, um, or, or whether this is just part of a bigger universal cosmic thing that we don't understand. It doesn't matter because what you're saying is true on all those levels, which is that we can't catch that other virus in the process of us trying to figure out what to do here. This is the danger, in my opinion, is the reaction to this problem, however it manifested. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if it's the end of a civilization, right, you know, if, if this, all of these things are just uh, one day they'll be categorized, you know, so when China fell, these were the preludes to it, right? So we could be right. seeing, because remember, even somebody who's got, you know, who's lived through the 60s and all must be asking the question, or not 60s, I'm talking about the late 80s when the communism wall came down. Why did they, why did dozens of countries fold it up and we still got China? It's like, where the hell have these people been, right? Mm. And then you go into that question of the, you know, the, the Axis, uh, not the Axis, but the, cold, the, the Iron Curtain countries saying, we're done with it. Yeah, because they wanted the permissive lifestyle. Nobody even hid this, right? I know people from Czechoslovakia and others. They wanted rock and roll and, you know, whatever, ice cream, you know what I mean? All the things that the East, Eastern Bloc was not giving you, the freedoms, you know? But a lot of those freedoms was, was nonsense, just like shopping and stuff, right? It was about having, you know, better uh, refrigerators and all of this, right? It wasn't just because we want to be free psychologically. I didn't hear anybody calling for that. Right. It was right. all about we want Western stuff. Yes. <laughs> we yes. want surfboards and remote controls and more channels mm -hmm, instant gratification mm -hmm. yeah. so then don't right so don't you see the chinese mentality is going we're gods we we st we stayed away from that you idiots bought the western you know garbage including freedom that's garbage too so you know like it's the old freudian thing right which marcuse as i said really restructured about prohibit prohibition and permissiveness so when the when the communist country said well, it's, it's over we're wrapping it up it was because they decided that the West was permissive. And as you say, it's not, right? L look at the nonsense that's going on, right? You just simply sneeze into your handkerchief and, you know, suddenly You're the troops are called out all around you. 
They're de-lousing right? you They're on ready the streets. To hang you. <laughs> Absolutely. Look at yeah. this nonsense. So I took this time, right, to do this presentation because of that. Right. So just don't think it's over there, the, the emotional plague, mm -hmm. saying it's not us, it's not us. Are you permissive or are you prohibitive, right? It's the two big twin peaks. It's mama and dada, right? And it used to be that the male was the prohibitive and the you know the mother was permissive. That's that's that has changed certainly, but the the underlying reality hasn't changed. The the structure of our own consciousness. So if this if if the people in China now on a very deep subliminal level want to be having the permissive society, they have to be. The lockdown is so extreme. Remember I said, uh, if the prohibition is too strong, it creates a reaction, right? If people live under uh, this draconian control institutionalized control there's something in the very psyche itself that rebels and this is the part that the uh, strict you know countries that we're talking about didn't get they watched europe they watched how communism toppled didn't they learn anything by the same token the western person who's grown up with mostly permissiveness probably isn't going to allow too much draconian control you say there's a couple of silver linings as that we've been pointing out in different shows you know, it'll happen for a while, you know, and it'll throw people for a loop. But people who've been highly permissive societies just don't change overnight and become, you know, control controlled societies, no matter what Bill Gates wants, because they're psychotic. Of course they want it. Right? These are people who are completely psychotic, uh, megalomaniacal. But no matter Part what those fools want. Oh, yeah. But, but, but no matter what they want, right, a permissive society is usually not going to be very easily shoved into some sort of a, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not that it's impossible, but it, it's very unlikely, right? And they've tried it incrementally through the Marcusean system. They've been working at it to see if we can go there, you know, through the cultural stuff. But you know, some things I keep maintaining, I don't think it's working. Mm. That's why these Bernie Sanders know there has been some flight. There has been some rolling up of the carpet and saying, it's done, mate. We can't, this Donald Trump, where the hell did he come from, right? And every time we open our mouths, we seem to, people, even liberals, fly away from the extreme radical left. Feminism is down to such a low percentage of actually real card carrying feminists and so on, so on, so on, so on. Now, the media blows it up, you know, with your Trudeaus and all to make it look like a big Leviathan. I think its base is jelly, is what, you know, what. But in those dying throes, they're desperate. You know, it goes mad. Yes, it's desperate. So it's not that I'm saying there's no higher conspiracy, by God, you know. We're just bracketing it for a minute so we can highlight one mm -hmm. other area, that if it's a civilization now, this is a very different sort of view of the whole, it's more of a Hegelian look at the thing. If there's a coming to an end of a civilization that is in fucking ruins, right? right? Whoa, that, that's going to change, right, our perspective, not only on what might happen over there, but also what, you know, it'll give us a, an insight into the roots of our own civilization which most people are impervious to. It's just something, a dispenser, you just stick in the quarter and you know, pull the lever and something comes out. They, we forgot the lineaments of civilization, of real infrastructure. And we've certainly forgotten how the Mitwelt connects to the Eigenwell, how self and world, self and society, I mean, you know, come together and have these roots. They're, very, they're hundreds of feet down, so most people don't get to think of it. They just see all the surface stuff. Great, more movies, more extravaganzas, right? More ga uh, ball games and whatever, and more stuff. Right, but no, not one of a million people could tell you how, what is society and where did it come from. And if we're seeing the melting down of a society in the East that was always rotten to the core, man, does that need to be studied. You're, you're in real time now. You know, you're looking through the glass at the exhibit. And w what an incredible opportunity. So my mind has been moving in that direction, you know, uh, uh, looking at that. And another one, just last aspect that might be important because it, it also, you know, it's relevant to us. And that, is, that to describe the littleness of the person who needs those totemic fathers, the totemic father gets to be who he is and he gets to maintain and sustain his control by a dynamic, which is just basically demonization, right? The littleness is a kind of demonization of your own inner being. I'm not worthy. I have no self-esteem. I'm evil. My id, my, uh, my, all my functions. Right? All my functions are uh, imperfect. Right? That's the meme going around, imperfection. And therefore, I allow the, the sergeant major, uh, major domo, I allow the all-father, you see, to structure my society. 
and I leave him carte blanche to do it whatever way he wants. There's not even any criticism. But the whole thing is coming from this little voice in the head, right? right which you, you embody the prohibitions of the arch side. But you do more than just do that. You have an innate feeling, is really what it is, that you're corrupt. That you're, it's like a, we were talking about Gnostic world Gnosticism. We did that in the past, right? That there is actually an active, a, a, a most extraordinary, powerful, universal Gnostic cult. We're sort of going over into that territory here, right? But without going there right now, we're doing that in other work. The idea is that, and, and that's why it can affect somebody here, it's the emotional plague that says, I'm not worthy. And you get it in the richest gated communities in the West as well. You get it in every, you know, hamlet, every suburb, every town. Every, a lot of people have this. And the remedy of it is, you know, self-esteem, right? And all the things we've explored, at great, of which capitalism is run, runs through that. You can't have one without the other. There's a lot of in the package. You know, and we've broken it down on enslaved, you know, over the years now. But just to keep it in focus, the person who thinks that they're unworthy and imperfect or sick, you know, in some way, the institution is grows and grows and grows. You've literally, through your own sense of littleness, right, allowed Leviathans to grow, and then you live in its shadow. And then you learn more and more depend on them, just like the socialists are always advocated for big government. This is where it comes from. Right, where this is where communism comes from. This is where today people always want some government to, you know, fix it. All nobody, nobody helps each other anymore. There's no, you know, bartering. There's, there's no feeling that we have any kind of real community. We have to be given the manual by this, you know, for every single thing. Look at the, look at the government now happily telling you what you can do with your own house and your own hands and your own face and your own, you know, belongings and your daily schedule. I mean, that is the antithesis. That's the apotheosis. Sorry of what we're talking about. And so I just wanted to make sure that people understand these unchangeable equations, that the man of self-esteem, right, it, who of no self-esteem, starts to inhabit unreality. And pen-pushing doctors and pen-pushing experts and pen push you know, all of these people that we then raise up, psychiatry, the religions, right, the government figures, it's all based in this negation. Uh, and it's all based in this uh, abscess, you know, where self-esteem should be, you get its opposite. And, you know, again, people need to really, you know, think about that and uh, wonder about how they're going to remasculinize, you know, because there is political ways of doing that. It involves political change, but it also involves psychological insight. And, Michael, that's so, um, you've always been that strong voice in this research community i don't even like calling it that because this is an individual journey you know but you've always been that voice to say okay we can point up at the hill at the tyrants and we know they have names and addresses and agendas and they get involved in all kinds of twisted dark occult stuff and they and that you know the chinese governments and the and the the nazis and the, the russian guy and all this stuff we've gone through it endlessly and and even when you're talking about the bill gates and the psychos up there and all that um they wouldn't exist. Your message has always been, we can't just point blame. They wouldn't exist if we were immune to that. That's the virus. That, this is the virus. If we were immune psychically, spiritually, and even physically from that, as you were saying, and didn't fall in lockstep with the culture that was polluted by these entities to create a world that looks like them. So you remember, if you have five major media corporations or six major media corporations that give you everything from your entertainment to your news to every, you know, whatever, and then you know that the people, you know, not everybody in there, but at, you know, at the very top, the people that make the decisions on those things are themselves polluted from within, which is why they gravitate to all this dark satanic stuff and whatever, right? They're trying to recruit you into a religion the same way that little Jehovah's Witness is knocking on your door trying to recruit you into their religion. And um, the same way that someone from any religion would try to recruit you. They're doing that, but you're unrecruitable mm. if you are self-activated, yep. if you are activated from within. <clears throat> and that's where I think people miss the boat on what you were saying about the self-esteem um, and even the system upon which that was based, which was the original form of capitalism, which came in with the idea of freedom behind it, which was the first time we ever saw anything like that. Because before that, we were all feudal serfs. And then when you look at the Chinese communist model, and you, I, I, I went through Mao Zedong's era, 
and really pulled out some deep stuff on that. And just seeing the, as you said, like I, I showed images in this video uh, from my, my last episode where it's the, it's the people in China and we've seen this all over the world where they're cheering for this guy, cheering, cheering, like crying, crying, right? Mm -hmm. And you go, that's right. that was the, that's, you inspired that in me was to look at it not from, oh, Mao Zedong is this evil bastard. Yeah, okay, that's pretty obvious. Why are people crying for him? Why are people cheering for him? Why are people, why are people reporting their neighbors? Why did that dad that just got charged over $1,000 for rollerblading with his kids in Ontario, why did he get arrested? Well, it was because people, his neighbors, who on a Sunday morning are probably mm -hmm. like, hey, how's it going, Bill? Sure. Called the freaking cops on him. So you can yell at you Trudeau all you want, which I've done plenty of that, and there's more to come. But what about your neighbors and your family who are turning on you like little traitors right now over this shit, reporting small businesses, sure. reporting people to go into the beat, you know, like wh where did that come in? If those are the people that have got the virus you're talking about, Michael, where they are the little man syndrome, little woman syndrome, no self-identity, no inner fortitude, strength, and virtue. Virtue comes with strength. Virtue is not handed with the package. Virtue comes through by way of strength, right? By growing strong in yourself. That's the person that has virtue. The people that stay weak inside are incapable of virtue, right? And so... These are the people that are going to go, yeah, you know what? I kind of like having all the social distancing. And it was another thing. There's, they're now hiring, Michael. You're, you're gonna, they're now all over Canada in, in like I think six different provinces are doing this new program called Community Ambassadors. Community Ambassadors, Michael, where you have people wearing little, you know, like the, they wear the little reflector jackets. Mm -hmm. They're given a whistle. And they walk yeah. around and they disperse people walking their dog in the park and they report you to the local bylaw officer and they tell you, get back off the car. These are who, who wants that job? The hall monitors of the world. Who is dying to have that kind of a job? Yeah. The little people, not the, yeah, the other little exactly. people, the little men people. Yeah, and, they, and they'll be officious and they'll be clipboard wielding and they'll yeah. do their job. They're the little men. And there's never an end of those people. And here's a weird paradox. We talked about how inflated imagos have created you know, are central to the communistic paradigm. We on the West have lost our heroes, mm. right? So, so, so you're, you're right. The, the little man is somebody who also, in some sense, feels a littleness, but not because he's got some gigantic imago that he's struggling under but because those have been systematically you know broken right in other words through our media they have uh, uh lo we've lost our morale in believing in the leader look look at all this reaction against mr trump right mm. and it's much deeper than that so the idea of the image ideal or the ego ideal is very crucial here because you need heroes but you can't in one breath you cannot uh, in one situation you kind of over inflate right and you can't have them not at all either right so then what this is all the this is the real building blocks of a society and through the media especially but feminism you know as we know it politically and the the one of the consequences of the demasculinization is the lack of heroism right the lack of heroism uh, that is then you know the unheroic personality type is the one who's crushed by this emotional plague and and that's why if you really want to defeat evil, you can't be gray, right? Because mm -hmm. this will just spiral on and on and on. You have, to be, you have to be clear. You have to be really wholesome in order to fight the inauthenticity of, of say, even a nation or a person. And see, this is the undercurrent of the West has lost its way so much that it's not really surprising, you know, that uh, this, this present situation has arisen. People are shaken now. Because they believe it's the end of you know the West or the structures of the West, but those structures were not that wholesome in the in, in the first place. They've been you know chipped away at for a long, long time. Yeah, this could be an opportunity you know, for us to rebuild it even better than it was, right? Like, right. And this time, one of the dynamics it happens with parents, but think of it again. We're thinking we took the individual you know pathology and we're trying to enlarge it, see how it fits. In order for the status quo in a necrophilus you know, relationship or a family to, to, to exist. Once those imagos, the child has got the parents, these toxic parents as the imago, he also accepts the false love that they offer up. They can only give false love because, you know, obviously they're 
necrophilus, right? They're, they're not wholesome. But the child in his innocence accepts their version of love and becomes a slave to that love until God knows how he's going to do it. He finds out that it is hypocritical and false, right? So this, the, the same thing is here, that where we have this identification, right, where we have this lack of self-esteem, we might be accepting, you see, false principles, and that's what the West has done. So when you talk about masculinization, that's what it involves, is not only coming back to self-esteem, but knowing the true from the false, right? Knowing the genuine fake from the genuine article. And that is a act of discernment and deconstruction. You know, there's a lot, that, again, all of these things we're touching on, there's a lot more to be said about it, right? But uh, right now what's happened is people cannot tell the genuine fake. Right? And our society is is, is uh, creating that. That's why a lot of these younger people go for socialism. That's what they can't tell the genuine fake. Right? Why would so many people convert to something that's got literally multi-millions of deaths? That f even as a philosophy, you know, pure Marxism failed. And the rehabilitations of it, you know, there's different thinkers all the way up to Herbert Marcuse. They're so irrational, even those, even critical theory, relativism, right? They're being taught in universities and know nothing about the implausibility of half the stuff they're even involved in yeah because they're never told the opposite right there's nobody there at the table there's nobody there in the front of the class saying let me really show you what the healthy thing is you think they've read ayn rand right or, or anything else that might you know present a case for for it no no they're saturating their it's minds so in the in the media the speed machine that's if you watch the average uh music video now if you look at what your average celebrities into and look at their instagram feeds and having them with like blood all over them and like that like just the monstrosity oh, yeah. of it this is what opened up the minds of these young kids because that's where you get in on the culture level the marcuse level through the culture you get all the satanic stuff pumping into their brains 24 7 recruiting them over um, at the violence, everything, right? And then you mm -hmm. come politically in the real world and you go, hey, uh, that was fun. Why don't we make that real? And, you know, here's the system. We'll all come together. And it's an easy sell because they've already corrupted the minds. Um, and th now it's an easy way to just get a few university professors in there and just start talking them with, with all this nonsense, right? Yeah. And they've misrepresented other conservative groups. Um, it's a very, very, you know, but again, looking at the basics, if people are losing, you know, any relevance here, remember the state is apparent. That's it. That's the, you know, that's the foundation of looking at a thing psychologically. And it is new to a lot of people. They don't think about it. And it's your state around you immediately. You should know this about your institutions and it works up the ladder as well. But if a toxic parent has been hypocritically pretend, you know, dishing out pseudo love, pseudo care, all the while crushing your sense of identity, preventing self-expression, so can a nation. Then comes uh, the return of the repressed, as it's often been called, you know, in which finally people say no more. We saw it in Europe, right, when people wanted goodies, you know, and skateboards. So they said, we want, you know, and then and, and this draconian thing collapsed. Great, right? Now China is there, the, one of the last bastions very important to the whole of the world's leftists that that, that still remains there you know these bertrand russells were in absolute awe and these marcuses were absolute awe of, of the chinese experiment so to speak the great leap forward yeah like hell into the abyss you mean so you know the china right now is the last mannequin right uh, to be wheeled out you know cuba will go right all these other places will just fucking fold up. The Korean communists, all of them will just fall, just disappear wherever this is. And a lot of, you know, there'll be a lot of um, collateral damage to socialism, even of the, even uh, all the types that we kind of know now, right? Our audience. And we'll be left with, you know, a sort of sensible liberalism, which I personally have no problem with, right? But all this radical shit will just fizzle if China falls. Now, I don't know if Donald Trump wants to be the greatest president that the, the America's ever had and history's ever had. He seems to be dragging his feet here. We should already be receiving massive checks to cover all the damage done. You know, in you the West. China. Uh, China. Yeah, damn it. I mean, that should be axiomatic, for goodness sake. So I don't like to see, you know, any hesitation there. You know, um, 
and if also if the lockdown lasts, we're not going to go into this now, but if the lockdown lasts any more than even another 10 days, we will might see feral gangland type of activity, which mm. will spiral out of control. You shouldn't even get it started because if it does, oh, then you'll find that that becomes one of the major issues, you know, of, of the near future. My goodness, you know, and then uh, something else, you know, like in six months with people like Fiona are seeing could involve something radical having to be done to stop that. So there's a couple of scenarios there. My feeling is it's China itself, the civilization, the big father. This thing is rotten inside, rotten inside. So rotten, the, the word doesn't even express it. So it must fall. It's teetering. And you know, it's like a house of cards going, get out of the way. right? And everybody sees it just teetering and you're just counting the minutes before it falls. And then nobody can predict what will happen. These buggers could you know, er erect something equally vile or they could just throw up their hands once and for all, say, yeah, we got it wrong. Right? We've lived in our littleness too long, and we suggest that you know people come in and we want to pattern on Japan or we want to pattern it on America. In doing that, what's what's even this Islamo communism, what you know the the uh, the crypto communism of Putin, all of that will be shaken to the core, and we may indeed be free of the paradigm completely and totally. So again, when people are in fear, try to hold on to that. You know, the, and, and it'll make a little bit more sense. And it'll make this, you know, sort of uh, tightening of the belts or whatever you want to call it, you know, the lean period here, a little bit more tolerable. There is that ray of hope. I, I totally believe it. And it just, it just, uh, it would be devastating to actually not see, you know, that uh, be carried through. Because as long as this form of socialism in every one of the hybrid forms exists, you know, we're, we're compromised. The whole of the West is, is teetering. And it's got a gun to its head. So, you know, my prayer is that, you know, a, a bigger action takes place and that China does fall. It's just as simple as that. And the Chinese people are not exonerable because they've not, in all these years since the fall of Europe, since 1989, and a little bit before that, so, you know, you could take it back a few years even before that, these buggers haven't overthrown, <clears throat> uh, obviously corrupt and evil, pestilential, government they have to have something external you know have it happen I, I have no mercy for you at all i am not identifying with you one bit you know and if, and if crisis happens on a, on a larger level too bad you had your chance this is the payment you get for not right following europe's model and this goes for any other little boogaloo country out there that thinks that you know communism is some solution to anything not realizing the pestilence it is. And I hope in this very brief sketch, we've just, uh, you know, uh, brought in a couple of new lenses, you know, so that some of the more psychological dynamics, you know, are, are highlighted so that people have that in their toolkit when they look at what's happening. But it's not just what's happening out there in the media. It's what's happening in your own, you know, own life. Psychological dynamics make the world go around. They're there. They are triggered. And, uh, you know, things that are on the top, like political movements and changes, right, are dependent upon the temper, the temperament that lies underneath. And if you don't know anything about it, well, the Marcuses of the world do. Your very people are dangling you like a blinking, you know, Pinocchio on a string. They know all about it. So my role is, is deficient if I don't come out and at least, you know, as unpopular as it is, try to, you know, do even just a, a beginner's guide on some of these things. And I know that Few, few people out there will start to brush up on their psychology and think about it. You know, what is, you know, uh, the prohibitive and the permissive and all of that? And what is the super ego? What is the ego ideal? How do I get heroes? Do I even need them? What happens if I have them too big? What happens if I don't have them at all, like the psychopath? You know, where, how do I find that middle ground then, Michael? Well, that's what we've got to already sit around and, well, you're not going to be able to unless you bring psychology back to the world table, do you? I don't even have, you don't even have the memo. Oh, well, how do, how, do, how do we get it off the table? Back to socialism, back to behaviorism, back to a mechanical, materialistic view of life, highly supported by Reds, highly supported by right atheists and all sorts of people like that. They, they prefer that kind of psychiatry. See, so we're into the whole question of the medicalization of everyday life and bring Thomas Zaz to the, an auto rank. See, there's a conversation that if you keep leaving it off the table, we're going to be the weaker for it, you know, and I, I've been working at it for years and trying to make it concise, you know, for people so that it's not 
too difficult because it really shouldn't be. You know, my job is to take very esoteric things and make them palatable to anyone who even comes in for the first time. You know, and that's what we've been doing. You know, work, walking over cut glass for years. You know, an immense, you know, story, immense struggle has gone into this. But it's pertinent to our times. It, it don't just get focused only on political ramifications. That would be another false action. You know, because we have some of the contagion that the enemy has. We want to get rid of that contagion, as we said. You know, so the case for psychology is quite strong, because it definitely impacts. You know, think about Waco. You know that fiasco there. Think about Y two K and you know all the other scares, right? That we've had the AIDS thing, right? The, the, the ozone layer. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. All of those are Big Brother pulling the rug, working on your psyche to riddle you with fear. But how can they do that unless you've already got fear inside? How can they traumatize you outside to that degree unless you're already traumatized existentially? And so on, you know, so it goes on. So yeah, very, very important to remain focused on some of the psychological uh, aspects of this. Well, I really appreciate you coming on to share that, Michael. And you've been you've been talking about this forever. Don't leave consciousness at the door. I think you said that on day one, and um, yeah. you, you've you've referenced so many great minds that have come before to say the same thing. Um, and you know, it's funny as you say, you know, if they if China if the China model fails globally and everybody sees it for what it is and it's exposed. Um, that also will cause a domino effect with, as you said, all the other countries that have gotten in and signed on for that program. And that also derails these high level occultists, these, these, these people that we've been talking about as well, the, the big brother, the, the hidden hand or whatever that disables them. Because if you read like Brzezinski and all of that, who is saying China is the model for the new world government and all this stuff, think about it. It, it exposes all of them as well. And none of what they would do would be palatable to the people, as you were saying. And all of these structures of evil and tyranny mm. and corruption would fall on their face if we as mm. individuals became strong immune cells in our society. And that's why, you know, as you were saying, don't, don't be afraid right now because we may need to see this unraveling. This is an uncomfortable period that is necessary to see greater times uh, move ahead and and remember a lot of people get stuck michael maybe there's a little message i have a quote from you i want to read to people but maybe you could finish with another element here is that there's a lot of people that are getting very pessimistic um because they're having difficulty reaching friends and family and talking to them and trying to wake them up to what's happening in the bigger picture and um, that alone becomes the obsession and then i feel like in a way even though they mean well and they want to go on this path of illuminating their self and all of that they distract themselves with the worry about, oh, well, I'm getting smacked around by everybody. Nobody's listening to me. Look at all the people reporting their neighbors and what are we going to do? And, you know, there's nothing we can do. And it's so big. Well, there's one quote that you've, there's two quotes I have from you and I'll let you pick up a, to wrap it up. One was that you said evil has within it the seeds of its own destruction. So to me, that says evil's not the only force in the world and they're going to trip over their own shoe and fall on their own sword one way or another. Okay. Sometimes you just got to get out of their way, let them be who they are. And then the other one was, this one always give me great strength. It says, if you have a great enemy, it's because you yourself are great. You deserve that enemy because the more powerful your enemy, the more it's going to awaken your inner power. Only the powerful have powerful enemies. So it's a, it's a, think sure. about that. When you're looking at, oh, look how big it is. Look how powerful Bill Gates is. He's coming with the global vaccine with quantum dots and whatever you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. the reason you have that the reason he has any power is because you have power and you he wouldn't be there or none of these people or the chinese regime or any of them stalin or pol pot they don't exist the moment you recognize what that statement's all about but maybe wrap it up for us here michael of course well exactly and the baseline of both of those is know who the enemy is over the latter one because we there's the word contained the word enemy what enemy so know thine enemy is the you know extrapolation of that second one. And it's exactly the same formula of the first one. Evil has the seeds of destruction within it. What's evil? Mm. Right? Both of them ask for definition. And so the, both of them are excellent because they definitely ask you to define evil and then define the enemy. Define the enemy, define evil. Right? And this is the job that the West is lacking now because, again, the great mentors that you know have inspired me, we're not reading those people. We're not reading the Ayn Rand's. We're not reading, we're not nourishing our minds with great thought. 
because that's what it actually takes for this process to happen. And those who will refuse, you see, to read the Blakes, right, and the Wilhelm Reiches and all, all of the people that we deal with all the time, because, oh, that guy was a Jew, or this guy's a socialist, or this guy's that, or, you know, whatever. Uh, well, you're just malnourishing your mind. And then you won't even be up to speed to do the work that, you know, wakens the keys of decipherment so that you can then tell the true from the false. It's a process. So evil does, does indeed contain within it the seeds of its own destruction. But one of the seeds of destruction is you knowing how to determine what evil is. If you, if you don't know what that is, then what does it matter? What, you know, what does it matter? And the reason why evil always has the seed of, uh, you know, is because evil is a form of corruption, right? It always negates a wholesome thing. It's always the negation of. If you read C.S. Lewis, right, the screw tape letters, really look into it, you'll find this out, that evil only exists out of something that's inactive good, right, uh, that has a veil drawn upon it where you have this self-doubt. Like we sort of expressed what we said before about self-esteem, littleness within, right? In that doubt, in that prevarication, it's like Theoden, right, being worm tongue until he doesn't know what the fuck is happening. He doesn't remember who he is. He has no idea what's going on, and the, and, and the Republic fails. So there's a definite need for sharpness, but you won't get it unless you're reading the sharp minds. And our education has made sure that we don't read the sharp minds anymore. Right? We've got some pus. You know, we've got, we got sludge culture. We've got scavenger research. And the good thing about this little, uh, you know, alternative community, and why I even bother still hanging on with it, is because to a degree getting smaller all the time. But originally the premise was that it brought you the great minds. It was a really good uh, placeholder, you know, your Anthony Sutton's especially, there's certain ones that are, you know, fantastic. And that will sharpen your mind. Well, then you, you know, broaden that out. You know, you, you move from that small point. It's very new to Americans, but you're learning a bit about conspiracy, you know, learning about the CFR, the round table groups. And then that gets you interested in, you know, the biographies of such and such all the way up to the black nobility, basically like my own work has done, right? Uh, unfolding from that point. And that's great. That's a great, great way to start. So that's why I came up with that, you know, theory or read it somewhere, whatever, you know. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely say also that evil, in that discovery of what evil is and discovering how weak it is inherently, psychology has to be brought in. I mean, that's just a conclusion that I've stood by since the 80s. As I slowly, slowly, you know, incrementally worked it out and read them all, not, you know, not, not, not noticing all the flaws in a lot of it, right? In fact, the, the, my work is built out of the flaws of a lot of these people's work. That's why people who pick up some of the books that I've been citing for years don't read actually anything in it that reminds them of what I said. Yeah, because that's not the way I've approached it. They go, Michael, you, you refer to this book and it doesn't have anything in it that, you know, pertains to what you say about it. It does, right? But it's the way you're coming at it, and it's the way I've come at it, right? That's why I can like C.S. Lewis, who's a Christian, I'm not a Christian. That's why I can read Erich Fromm, even though he was a liberal. That's why I can read Sigmund Freud, even though he was a Jew, <laughs> and all the rest of it, right? I can do, what's wrong with that? Why isn't everybody doing that? Because they don't love knowledge. They want knowledge for the power that it brings you. They do not want a relationship with it for the love of it. Well, philosophy means love of wisdom. And there's not one in a million people in the world who even know what that all is. Give me some power. Yeah, I'll take it. Give me some hoop jumping and get a you know, couple of stripes from the college. Then I'm into it. Uh, I'm a megalomaniac and a narcissist, so I'll quote a few lines from Shakespeare and you know everybody will love it. You know, It'll be a great thing at the party, at the parties. What the hell has that got to do with it? Love of knowledge is what Steiner was about, what Blake was about, what Manley Palmer Hall was about, what Madame Blavatsky was about, right? And, and many, many others. So I just laugh in the face of those people who haven't read the memo when it comes to that. And laugh in the face of people who refuse to incorporate, you know, psychology. But I'll meet people halfway. I, I've designed my work to meet halfway. So, you know, I know it's new to you. So for those who do want to come there, hey, I'll, I'll you know, lay out a few facts. I'll bring the, the masters, basically. I'll bring it there. And then the enemies of civilization. We have a thing called civilization, Western, capitalistic, whatever you want to call it. 
There is a phenomena, and then there's the enemies of civilization. Don't know how it can be made any easier. Psychology comes in because aren't you interested in what then goes on in the mind of a Karl Marx? A Fournier? A Robert Owen? A Frederick Engels? A George Soros? Uh, a Vladimir Lenin? Right? Or any of the ideologues? Aren't you fascinated by how they can be psychotic? Wouldn't, wouldn't a book on that subject be absolutely critical for you to read? It would be if, if, if you want to really defeat evil. Not just talk about it, but really go into it and learn it. Because actually, that study makes it holy, and therefore everything pertains to your own dynamic. Right? Everything you may be learning on the historical, then you start to move to a place where you go, well, that fucking Tassarian was right. This I'm, I've got sweat on my brow now. This has become personal. I do this. I signed on for that. Oh my God, right? That's what psychology does. And that's why people often don't want to touch it because it finally will you know, take you on a journey and you come right wrong to yourself where you say, oh my God, I am armored. I have emotional plague. I have false imagos. I've bought pseudo love. And I, I'm sh ashamed because for years I accepted it as the real thing. That's what we're talking about. Self-awareness, self-transparency, self-conversation. And when you're deeply involved in that, religion means nothing. Politics means nothing. It all goes out the door. Because now you're where you need to be. You've snapped into the place you need to be, the Siddhartha Road. All those other things are included, but they fade into the background. Right? Because you realize now they've all been distractions. They've all been distractions waving you over you know so that you ultimately lose the concept of selfhood or any any concept of it at all you know and i refuse you know i refuse so rather than go off and do other things i i was just stuck at it you know and of course with your help we, three years ago uh, you know it took it to a whole other level making it a little bit easier the platform you know to then hone in and that we're right there get rid of all the backlog of stuff and get to the really serious matters that's what unslaved has done so you know, it's a great work and long may it continue. Long may indeed. And well, I got, I got goosebumps what you're saying there. Cause it's so true. I went through that same process and I'm still going through it. You know, it's a, it's an endless journey and, you know, think about it. Any power in the world, whether they be a government, a local government, a world government, a CFR round table, anybody or your neighbors or your family, anybody that is trying to restrict and destroy and inhibit your freedom, your freedom of thought, your freedom to uh, research topics you're interested in, your freedom to even be wrong and then learn that you're wrong and go on, you know, your freedom to wander because not all who wander are lost, right? C.S. Lewis, um, you know, or, or your freedom of movement or your freedom to, you know, leave your house a certain amount of times a day without getting a text from the government to tell you to go back home because you're, you're not doing social, whatever it is. There's a reason why they want to restrict your freedom. And there's a reason why we have been advocating for individual freedom and why the West instituted that and was the only successful uh, experiment of it, even though we've failed in it in many regards, as you said earlier, but it's still, it was better than other places so far, right? The reason is, is because mm -hmm. they know that if, if they want illegitimate power over you, they have to take your power away from you. It's as simple as that. And what, what, what you've been saying, Michael, is it's not just by force. It's not just the Orwellian version of it. There's that for sure, but it's more so that subtle, the Huxley version, I think. I've been reading the, both of them side by side in the last few weeks. 1984, Brave New World. What an amazing view to have. Um, and you realize, oh, wait, I gave it to them willingly because I was afraid. I gave it up because I was afraid. And that's when these forces step in. And so even people that are all concerned about the virus and all that, fine. Hey, we'll talk. But um, remember, there's a bigger virus out there that is going to scavenge this. And they're only successful if you go, I don't want my self-responsibility anymore. I'm too scared. Can you do it for me? They're like, yay. Just like Jim Jones right. did it. Just like all these other people we've studied did it. 
The go- of course, that's what, they, that's what they do. That's what government does, right? And so hopefully one day we can get to a, some kind of a benign government or, or some kind of structure because you have to have order of some kind. But as you, I just, I'm so, I'm moved by that idea. And I, it, it was what inspired the cult series I did before and that I'll be continuing. It's what's inspired our entire work at Unslaved. That's the concept, by the way, Unslaved, to unslave yourself, not just from the government and all that, but to unslave yourself from the things you're doing to be complicit in your own servitude and your own slavery. And that's the difference. Mm-hmm. That's what makes all the difference. So I really appreciate you coming on to break it down, uh, Michael. And we'll be doing more. Great. Um, we also had an absolutely fantastic show on su- uh, Sunday. Um, we had Peter Revere coming on, uh, talking about symbolism. And we went down some pretty deep rabbit holes. Uh, I did post the link in the chat. And we're going to do part two this week. So you'll probably get that uh, Monday. And uh, I can't wait to do that. So Continue to support us over at Unslaved. It is premium content for a reason. It's just getting started, and we're going to be here no matter what. Uh, unslaved.com is the site. And also, uh, Michael, you've also been producing in the background. You're producing music. You've been very zen, man. You've been just writing articles, producing music, um, You know, taking your snake for a walk, as you like to say. Uh, <laughs> do you have any new albums coming up or anything like that? And maybe let people know your music site, because I don't think a lot of people know that you're a musician and you've produced a lot of albums as of late. Yeah, there's five out uh, on face on what's called iTunes. Go to msrmusic.com, and there's a sixth one. It's just been a little held up. Most of it, uh, there's only four songs, four tracks to record, and it's just been one thing or another getting in the way. But it's because there's been other monumental stuff that we've done through last year, mm. you know. Uh, and there's just that just a little bit had to be put on hold, but it's already half. Rec- it's recorded, you know, pretty much all the tracks. So it's just a matter of sitting and down and uh, yeah, that'll come out eventually. But five, five whole works, five whole CDs are available. Uh, articles, yeah. Again, uh, because uh, Unslaved has uh, helped us, you know, helped me get all the different research, you know, uh, out. It's allowed then a lot of cleanup as well of things that were very, very important and, we, and you know, had to be parked, so to speak. You know, now they can be brought into the fore. A lot of miscellaneous stuff. Um, which I think is in itself very, very, very interesting, mm-hmm. you know. But there's no way that I could get to those while these really, really, uh, you know, higher level platinum sort of content, you know, got done. But it's got done, so there's, it's just that extra bit of time now to explore, you know. And uh, yeah, there's a new book on its way probably this year. Uh, there's two premiums. There's going to be many more than that. But there's two hot premiums uh, on the way, which I just need to edit, and then there'll be a uh, in the in done probably towards the end of the year. There's a premium we'll do as a bio of my life, For short, not not a very long thing, but uh, we may be in Europe filming. So I'll been looking forward also. It's it, just doing a very short, you know, sort of a bio of, of growing up in Ireland and showing some of the sites that got me interested in symbolism, mm-hmm. you know, around the city of Belfast. I'm hoping you to know, fly out uh, for that. I'd, I'd love to. If, if we get the air travel yeah. back up, I want to come down and help that project project as well because yeah. I think that would be yeah. an amazing story to tell. Yeah. You hook up with Fiona and her wonderful yeah. husband. and Yeah. yeah. But the reason why I want to do that, right, is because the sites in Belfast now, are they're on their last legs. Mm-hmm. They're still there. Even with all the years of change, and they steamrolled so many parts of the of the city that I love, but there's still enough there, just about. So if I miss this opportunity and don't do it soon, half that shit won't be there. You know, places I went to school, places I've lived, there a lot of them are demolished already. You can you can see this on Google. You know, when you go and look at the at the city, which I do, I look at the cities of all the places I've lived, and it look it, it sort of like perked me up and went. Hey, dude, you better bring that that project way forward because, you know, there's going to be a new infusion of millions of dollars, you know, from the government into the Belfast. The infrastructure is slightly crumbling. The first wave was around 2008 and before. There was a big, you know, they call it the, I can't remember. It's just like a bubble, you know, of investment. And, of course, that meant a lot of desecration. But it was good for the city in, in, in other ways, right? But what it did was it wiped away a lot of the traditional places, you know, that I would have known. 
if there's a second wave of investment, and I've heard that it's coming, by the way, it's, it's not right now, but within a short time, there'll be an onslaught that will probably take away what's left of any of the Belfast I ever remember. And then what kind of video are you going to do when right. it's all gone? You know, wow. ridiculous, right? Yeah, so there'll be a little, you know, just things about, you know, growing up in Belfast, Jim Fitzpatrick, you know, and all the things that kind of got me into the, what I was doing in the 80s. Very, very short, but it's time to do it now. It's time to do it now because a lot of it may be swept away. You wouldn't believe what's happening in Belfast, you know, with immigration and desecration and, and, and just the erasure of any kind of authentic Northern Irish, you know, Ulster sort of uh, traditions. They're disappearing by the day. I'm really, really worried about it. I'm really chronically worried about it. So then I thought, well, that thing you were going to do on yourself, you know, better, you know, better move that project up. So that'll be available for premium members down the line as well. There's, and there's, there's lots of other, other projects yeah. in the works. Yeah. We're not, we're just getting started. And so, uh, yeah, well, with that said, we'll, we'll stop this stream here. I uh, just want to encourage people. If you'd like to support our work, go over to unslaved and for 12 bucks a month, you get access to thousands upon thousands of hours. Um, all the old archives, all of Michael's old uh, research, uh, we cleared it off of YouTube because of many, many reasons. Um, and now it's over there on Unslaved as an archive. We have episodes coming out every week. There's multiple premiums there. There's unique articles. Um, and uh, this is what keeps this work going and allowing us to continue doing this push. And I also encourage you to support other alternative media right now um, and to not support the mainstream media who is you know, just spreading this virus around like nothing else. Um, so support your favorites. Uh, we do this for you and uh, we really appreciate it. So thanks for joining us and we'll catch you guys next time. Cheers, everyone.